So this panel with leading practitioners and activists in the region will um, grapple with questions about how climate justice is being defined, by whom, and the implications of this for urban planning. Uh, Professor Hugo Sarmiento, uh, Assistant Professor at Columbia GSAP, will be moderating the session. So um, Hugo, if you're ready, I'll pass things over to you now. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that introduction, Ranjani. Um, it's really great to be here with you all today. I'm very excited to meet uh, Victoria, and I've met Ariella and Danielle before, <laughs> uh, but this is a great panel and very much looking forward to this uh, discussion. Um, as Ranjani uh, explained in the introduction, uh, part of the objective of putting together this panel specifically is to try to focus the discussion on how the climate crisis is being defined and by whom. Um, we think this is important because as you know, climate change and climate policy debate is now uh, in the headlines almost every day. Um, it is now part of the public discourse around the world. Um, but typically it is uh, narrated and defined by the more powerful uh, social, political and economic elites uh, in society. Um, so not too long ago, we had the COP talks in Glasgow where the most uh, powerful and the richest nations in the world were debating what to do about climate change. But this leaves out um, and excludes really um, the most impacted and the most vulnerable communities um, that have to deal with the consequences of climate change. And so we want to today focus a discussion on uh, scholars, um, organizers, um, and professors like you all um, here on the panel um, to try to get a sense of how you think of the climate crisis, how you talk about it, how you define it, and how you understand it impacting the communities that you work with. So um, I've prepared two sets of questions here, and the format is somewhat open, um, but the questions are, are meant to just guide the discussion. So um, I'm gonna pose the, the questions uh, to the panel and then give you uh, an opportunity to uh, respond to the questions. Um, so we'll do that in, in two sections here. Um, and then we will open it to uh, the audience um, that's joining us today um, to ask their own questions um, and join the conversation that way. Um, so uh, let's begin um, with the first set of questions. The first set of questions are pretty straightforward is um, we want to sort of share the kind of diverse uh, range of communities that you all represent um, and, and, and talk about this, this issue of the climate crisis with respect to those communities. So the first question is, how is the climate crisis impacting the community or communities that you represent? And how is your work addressing this issue? So. Um, Let's uh, start with Victoria, if that's okay. Um, and then we'll turn over to Ariela and then uh, Daniel uh, will follow up. Thanks. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? There are a few technical difficulties earlier. Yep, okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel um, this morning and afternoon for everyone on the East Coast. Um, again, my name is Victoria Keener and um, I'm actually speaking to you from Honolulu today. Um, where I do most of my work in Hawaii and the Pacific Islands. Um, so the question of um, how is the climate crisis impacting the communities I represent is actually a very um, complex one with a lot of layers. Um, so just to start with a little bit about the Pacific Islands region. Um, uh, so I work in Hawaii and particularly the US affiliated islands or the US API as I'll refer to them. Um, the US API are comprised of Hawaii, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of Palau, and the territories of Guam and American Samoa. Um, so issues of equity in that region really start with the vastness of our ocean region, the diverse geographies within there, the varied governance and socioeconomic conditions, um, in the presence of the US military in the history of the region, uh, the climate data that's available, which is not as much as a lot of mainland locations, 
um, monitoring, which is not as much at monitoring stations and the, the models that are available. Um, so, um, so, so for example, we have um, US, British and French colonial histories in the area. Um, again, we have um, a state, US territories, organized and unorganized commonwealths um, in terms of governance um, and the freely associated states, which are governed by the Compact of Free Association or the COFA. And a lot of this is history that just isn't um, very well known uh, in the, in the um, mainland United States. Um, but a lot, of, um, a lot of what you hear when you, when you hear about Pacific Islands being impacted by, um, by climate change first, is that uh, a lot of the people who live here in the communities are being out um, uh, disproportionately affected by climate impacts that they did not um, that they did not perpetuate. Um, so um, the other th ways that uh, that we're experiencing it include um, high temperatures, especially at um, highest elevation islands. Um, so our highest elevation ecosystems are most at risk of, of high temperatures. Um, sea level rise, of course, all of our communities are coastal and most of the infrastructure is located on a thin band of, of land right next to the coast. Um, uh, precipitation changes, um, those differ throughout the region, but we're seeing generally more extreme rain and more extreme periods of drought, um, which is a big problem across the, the tropical Pacific, although you might not first think of uh, drought in the Pacific is being an issue. Um, and of course, ecological impacts that are cascading throughout um, throughout the, the, um, the community, such as um, coral bleaching and, um, uh, and death and fishery populations changing um, both size and location throughout the region. Um, and the larger kind of specter of um, um, climate and environmental security throughout the region. So um, we have a large military U.S. presence throughout the region because of the Compact of Free Association, and we continue to be affected by um, the U.S. military and um, its actions throughout the region, um, and how environmental security is, is plays out with them. Um, uh, there's a lot of attention on the region because of the future of China's impact in the region. So um, it's all very complex, but that's just a kind of uh, kind of big backdrop, and I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks. You're on mute, Hugo. And I, uh, Victoria, I just want to ask if you could respond to the second part of that question, which is about your work and oh, sorry. addressing, yeah. Yep. Addre so, um, just the, how your work addresses uh, this issue of the climate crisis. Yep, sorry about that. So um, my research group, um, we concentrate, uh, we're an interdisciplinary group of research and resource managers. Um, so uh, my background is in hydrology and climatology, um, applied hydrology. Um, our research group has climatologists, hydrologists, um, social and physical geographers, natural resource economists, legal scholars, decision scientists, psychologists. Um, so we're a very interdisciplinary group of people that are working together on um, common problems within the region that are um, co-developed with our stakeholder communities in Hawaii and the Pacific Islands. Um, so we work on um, specific questions of how to transform climate data, climate models, um, climate research into on the ground um, management and policy. So for example, we'll, we'll, we work with um, mostly agency and government level um, usually not directly with communities, although we do some of that as well. Um, but we work with water managers in American Samoa, for example, and, and um, energy groups in Guam and American Samoa, or um, or public health officials in the Marshall Islands um, to to look at how to take climate data and make it more applicable to the planning that they're doing currently. So our data has been used to. Um, advanced uh, water project protection legislation in Guam. It's been um, used in national adaptation plans for um, climate planning um, in the Marshall Islands. It's It's been, um, uh, so th there are a wide variety of uses, but basically, so we're an interdisciplinary and applied research group that works throughout the region. And, and we're very conscious of um, making sure all of our research questions are co-developed with the people that we're working with. Okay, great, thank you. 
Um, okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Ariela now. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, just one update on that bio. That bio was from two years ago. I've since the, the Green New Deal plan, I've been teaching a course at GSAP on equitable climate action. And that class, uh, similar to my work, so I'm actually answering uh, question number two right now, um, is really about helping, not students, but helping local governments figure out how they can ensure equity and social justice is the center of the climate action work they're doing. And by climate action work, I mean both mitigation, so things that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, you know, the energy efficiency, the electrification, the renewable energy, the getting people out of their cars, the waste reduction, so that's, that's mitigation for, for those who are not familiar with the language, but also on the enhancing the, the resilience, the climate resilience, of the communities. I'm currently most actively working on the resilience side in the city of, of Philadelphia and a few different projects. And on the mitigation side, yeah, Seattle, Los Angeles, a little bit in Denver, um, a lot in Philadelphia. And my work always seems to intersect with what's happening in New York City as well, since I had worked here for over, over a decade, uh, actually over two decades almost in, in New York City. Uh, so the, the work we do is very much about the how we move forward, um, ensuring equitable approaches to climate action. You know, it's very clear both on the mitigation and adaptation side that it's not just about the what, the, the shiny solution. It's not about, you know, your electric vehicle over here or solar panels here. And on the other side, it's not specifically about a flood wall per se, not that those strategies aren't helpful and not that we don't have to have them in the ground, but it's really about the how, the process, you know, who's at the table, whose priorities are being prioritized, are centered, who benefits, <laughs> who, will, uh, who will be burdened, and if there are expectations that they'll be burdened. How are those burdens uh, minimized? Um, but also at the end of the day, like how do we set the stage for real equitable outcomes from the beginning? You know, inclusive processes lead to uh, more equitable outcomes. So, but that's easy to say. To actually do it is really, really hard because we're dealing with decades and decades, if not centuries, of distrust. And so what I'm seeing in every city is how hard it is to do what you think is right, because you have to meet people where they are. And right now, for very good reason, there's a lot of distrust. There's a distrust because of all the layers of inequalities that have been burdened on segments of the population, particularly black, brown, and indigenous populations. And you can't just snap your fingers and say, okay, but we want you to be in the center of our solar strategy. It's like, excuse me, I had housing quality. I'm living in an area next to um, a toxic site. You ran your highways around me. I actually don't have family wealth in housing because you displaced us beforehand. My health isn't good. My house is moldy. Like there's a lot of real life urgent needs that need to be addressed. And so helping planners or local government folks who realize and feel that urgency of climate action, like we wanna make things better so that the impacts aren't worse, also realize you know what, we have a lot of harm that we need to address and we need to be inclusive, we need to be transparent, we need to be held accountable and we need to build relationships from scratch and we're gonna have to work hard to actually build those relationships and the trust. That's what I work on. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Daniel. Sure, thanks Hugo, and thank everyone for having me here today. It's very much um, a pleasure to be here and speak to all of you and, and learn from all of you as well. So as was mentioned in the intro, I work at RISE, the Rockaway Initiative for Sustainability and Equity out in Far Rockaway in Queens. So for anyone who doesn't know, the Rockaways are a 13 mile long peninsula off the Southern coast of Queens in New York City. 
And it has a fraught history. So if you were to look at the sort of geography and de demographics of Rockaway today, when you come over one of the main bridges into Rockaway at about Beach 95th Street, you can either turn left and go to the east end of Rockaway, or you can turn right and go to the west end of Rockaway. The west end of Rockaway is very much a wealthy community and very much um, mostly a white community, whereas the communities on the eastern end are communities of color. And they have been the communities that have faced the brunt of climate change on this coastal community. And as Ariella mentioned, have a lot of distrust in the government and, and the, the lawmakers in New York City because of decades of, of neglect and, and just, you know, decades of neglect and a lack of resources that have been provided to them. So a little bit of history on the Rockaways. It was a resort community throughout the late 19th century and into about the 1920s, but then it started to decline. It became the area that as highways and, and, and you know, the automobile came into fruition that, and everyone was able to leave the city to go further out to take their vacations and go to the beach and resorts, it became sort of the place to put people that the city didn't want in Manhattan. So as the city got rid of, of housing and apartment buildings in Manhattan to build places like Lincoln Center, the people that were displaced because of that were sent to Rockaway against their own will. There they tried to build, you know, generational wealth and, and homes, but did not, were not provided the resources that they needed to, to have that to their fullest potential. So we're working in a community that has just really not been the, the focus of New York for a long time. As a coastal community climate, the climate and a changing climate was always at the forefront of people's minds, but less so before about 2012. 2012 was really a turning point where the general public was brought into the conversation much more. And that's because that's when Hurricane Sandy happened. So that was one of the biggest devastations to the Rockaways after a sort of renaissance started to begin in the early 2000s when new shops were opening and more economic opportunities were coming to the peninsula. But 2012 came along, Hurricane Sandy happened and communities were devastated. The boardwalk was lost. Generational wealth that was you know, starting to be built up, people lost their homes and lost most of their belongings. And it became sort of a wasteland for a while until it could get back on its feet. Hurricane Sandy really showed people that we are a coastal community that needs to bring climate change to the forefront and educate as many people as possible as quickly as possible. And that's where RISE comes in. So RISE works in the Rockaway communities in a number of different ways. We're based in Auburn, but we also do work in Edgemere and Far Rockaway as well. We work across the peninsula, but Arvern, Edgemere, and Far Rockaway are sort of, you know, that's our home. So we're working with the communities that are there. One of our biggest, you know, our bread and butter is youth programs. So we have a youth program called Shorecore, and that youth program engages local high, high school students to work on climate issues as well as civic issues and youth leadership skills. With the Shore Corps, we have hosted a number of community events along the peninsula to enhance our shoreline. So as a coastal beachfront community, our beach is always under the threat of erosion. So we've had to do, what we've done is planted about 10,000 sprigs of beach dune grass along, along the, the shoreline, as well as over a thousand trees and shrubs in order to bring back our dune system. So you plant these, these shrubs and grasses on the northern side of the boardwalk. And once their roots build, grow deep into the sand, it creates a green infrastructure that can build up that dune, which then protects communities from storm surge during, during events like, like hurricanes and, and tropical and tropical storms. So on Beach 25th Street, we saw the result of this. That was the block that was most built up with this green infrastructure before Sandy. And it was one of the blocks in Far Rockaway that faced the least amount of flooding during that hurricane. 
So that's one of our big pushes with our uh, short course students, as well as with the local community, because we always invite the local community to come out to these plantings, be a part of it, and get their hands in the sand. After Hurricane Sandy, we also held a number of different talks with uh, climate scientists and, and officials from all over the world, from, you know, from, from the Netherlands, where they're dealing with flooding on a regular basis. Um, we invited professors, scientists, and, and policymakers to come to Rockaway and present to the local community to educate them on how they can prepare for a rising sea level and more severe storms, but also for everyday flooding, which is probably one of, which is probably the biggest threat and biggest challenge that people on the eastern end of Rockaway face on a daily basis. So even if there's just a light rain, even sometimes when there's not rain, just during a high tide, the streets will flood and cars will have to wade through two to three feet of water. People getting off the subway will have to find a different way to get to their location because they can't cross the street when they come off the subway. So we have been working with organizations such as the Science and Resiliency Institute at the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Conservancy to document this flooding and then figure out ways that we can work with the city to, to change some of the infrastructure to help drain that water as it's coming in. We're also currently, this is probably our biggest push at the moment, working with a lot of developers, but also the city on new development projects that are happening in Arvern, Edgemere, and Far Rockaway. Arvern East is the, the largest undeveloped coastal plot of land in Queens that has not been developed. And that land after decades and decades of it being just a wasteland where people can throw garbage, the streets were not paved, the sidewalks were not paved. It's finally being developed by um, a number of different uh, private developers, the biggest one being l &M Development. RISE is working with them to establish a, a, a plant, um, a not a plant nursery, a, a sort of, uh, natural park system that can that can absorb water when when the floods come in. We're also working in Edgemere, which is going to have a community land trust very soon. There are 55 vacant lots in Edgemere that the city is subsuming into a community land trust. And we've worked over the past six months to hold community design forums where the community has come to rise to sort of design how these lots that will be zoned for open space can be used to for temporary uses that the community can enjoy, but that can then be taken away to again absorb those flood waters when they come in. We're also working in Auburn on one other lot to develop an, an open space site with that will focus on arts and, and lighting and, and a place for people to gather and talk to each other. Um, where we can have more of these conversations and continue to educate people about the climate issues in their community and make sure that their voices are heard in all of the work that's happening now in Rockaway, now that it seems to have be another hot spot for development in the 2020s. So that's a little bit about RISE and the, the work that we're doing. Great, Great. thanks so much, Daniel. Uh... Okay, and you know the, the next set of questions, I, I think you already started to address this, um, in your comments, um, but it's very much about um, the nature of the, of the current policy debate in your area. Um, as I referenced at the beginning, um, the debate over the climate crisis and the response to the crisis um, is taking place globally. Um, again, we see it in events like the Conference of the Parties in Glasgow, um, taking place on a national scale dominated by the most powerful uh, global actors um, it's also taking place at a national scale. Um, you know, recently there was a debate around the climate bill and the infrastructure bill that was eventually passed, um, which has some provisions designed to address um, uh, the changing climate. I wanted to ask you um, on the panel, what does this policy debate look like in your area? Um, what are the sort of priorities um, in, in this policy debate um, in your area? And what do you think is missing from that conversation? Um, so I'm going to turn it over now to Victoria. Thanks. And um, thanks, Daniel and Ariella, for your comments, too. Really good work and, and interesting. 
Um, so in thinking about this question, um, you know, again, it's going to be very specific to the Pacific Islands, um, but I think that's kind of, you know, the, the perspective that you're looking for, how things are, are different um, in other places. But one of my other roles, um, besides all of the, the research work that I do and, and um, is I'm appointed to the City and County of Honolulu Climate Change Commission. Um, and so I'm one of five, um, five experts that sits on this commission, is appointed this commission to um, provide uh, recommendations to the Honolulu mayor, city council and departments um, kind of about the localization of climate impacts on the island of Oahu, which also functions as a county. Um, and so in that, um, I've, I've been appointed for, seems like forever, but maybe three years now. Um, one, of, one of those years, um, I chaired it. So it's a five-year term, and we've been asked to provide, um, we've been asked by the city to provide input on sea level rise planning, um, on uh, setbacks, so, um, uh, the, the distance um, that you can build from the shore and the regulations gathering uh, surrounding that. Um, we've been asked to provide um, guidance on climate and financial risk planning for the city. Um, and then we've also provided guidance that was not solicited from the city um, on um, equity and adaptation processes. We've um, also provided input on um, the social cost of carbon at a city scale and how to implement that. Um, but I guess kind of um, what I see, you know, talking from the kind of science, science to policy boundary space and how that, um, you know, science to management translation actually happens. Sitting on the commission has been definitely the most eye-opening thing for me in terms of how this data actually gets used. Um, and a lot of it is having somebody at the top who is open to incorporating that information into planning. Um, and I, you know, you can be shocked when um, how quickly things can happen when you have someone at the top um, who is ready to go with a lot of these. And if you don't, it just will sit there no matter how many recommendations, no matter how many um, official committees and commissions there are that are recommending these, um, these measures. Um, so I think that some of what is uh, missing from the conversation is kind of um, a true sustained uh, desire to kind of transform how society addresses climate adaptation, how communities and organizations um, become more resilient by getting more resources, both um, financial and human. Um, we, we don't have as many people throughout the whole Hawaii and Pacific Islands region as a lot of other places. So, you know, we can be short on human capital as well. Um, all of the, the different agencies and departments that we work with are always um, short on people that have, that, you know, they have 16 other jobs and they're being expected to integrate climate change, adaptation and mitigation as well. So there's always that, um, um, that uh, gap. But the other thing that I wanted to mention was the difference in access to um, funding throughout the Pacific Islands region. So um, the US affiliated Pacific Islands do not have equal access to federal funds that can reduce um, risks at those community levels and make, for example, infrastructure more resilient to the impacts of climate change. Um, and that's because of our different governance um, throughout the region. So we have a state, Hawaii, um, two territories, Guam and American Samoa, um, and then the freely associated states, which are kind of on their own in, in terms of um, being able to access um, different, uh, different monies. Um, so in terms of FEMA, which is a big funder for infrastructure climate resilience project, Hawaii and the territories can receive FEMA money, um, but the freely associated states cannot. So that's already one type of inequity that we're seeing that's not being addressed um, adequately. Um, and another one is within actual um, disbursement of FEMA money. So some of you may be familiar with the BRIC program within FEMA, which is uh, building resilient infrastructure and in communities. And it's how a lot of um, uh, climate resilience and infrastructure money gets pushed out to doing specific projects in communities, um, hazard mitigation projects, and, it, and it's nationwide, um, but again, not in the freely associated states. So in um, the FY 2020, BRIC funds were distributed quite unequally 
um, with I believe 94% of the total available funding being awarded to projects on the mostly urban East Coast. Um, so the, the counties in Hawaii um, submitted 13 applications to the national competition for the funding um, in 2021 and none were funded. And so um, this was uh, because when we dug into it, a lot of the um, uh, without updated um, IBC and IRC codes, so building and energy codes being up to date, Hawaii, Guam, and American Samoa are really not competitive at that federal uh, program, which is intended to equalize communities access to resilient and safe infrastructure. Um, so we were really seeing that without this, you know, I think it's minus 40 points automatically for not having your building codes up to date, your energy codes. Um, and so we were not able to access any of this infrastructure money while the freely associated states in this case are excluded completely. Um, so in terms of, you know, um, what, what might be missing in terms of policy in this region, it's pretty, um, pretty universal across Hawaii and the Pacific Islands that climate adaptation and mitigation is, you know, the number one um, threat that, that governments and communities are looking to deal with um, in the long term. And um, we're not able to get access to a lot of the, um, a lot of the resources out there that would help bring a lot of the communities and, and different islands up to, um, up to par in terms of um, being able to prepare. Thank you. Um, okay, I uh, wanted to turn it to Ariella. My chair literally broke as soon as I unmuted. <laughs> so sorry about that loud bang. Okay, there's no more cookies here. Um, so I'm going to take this in a very different direction. Since Victoria and Daniel are doing such a great job of focusing on resilience, I'm going to focus on the on the mitigation piece and the nature of the policy debates. I mean, there's, there are policy debates on different levels, right? There's at the philosophical level, there's that like urgency to act and to act quickly, <laughs> um, especially with the, the latest IPCC report that came out and the one for policymakers saying, you know, forget about your 2050 goals, like what are you doing by 2030? This urgency from the folks within governments or those who are you know, the climate hawks of the world. It's just like, we gotta go, we gotta move, we gotta transition, like let's get rid of the gas, like let's just go, 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 go. And then there's, um, then there's community. And then there's folks who are, as I mentioned earlier, are dealing with real life urgent issues related to having safe housing and affordable housing and mobility concerns and health concerns. And they're like, excuse me, you're gonna keep moving quickly. You're gonna keep the existing economic systems in place that have continued to not only leave us out of the opportunities, but also continue to burden us with the unintended consequences of you trying to move quickly. And so there's this push to move quickly and scale up and let's do the one policy that captures everything. And then there's this need for place-based approaches that bring people along, have a real planning process that centers not just the priorities of, of um, communities, but also actually takes the time to address the real concerns. Like, don't talk to me about building electrification until we talk about the fact that there are tens of thousands, I'm in Philadelphia right now, there are tens of thousands of households that are in need of home repairs. Like the homes are of such low quality that even putting their heat on, they're just throwing dollars out the window um, or they're constantly uh, breathing mold or, or other health issues. So, you know, I, I'm glad you want me to get a heat pump. Sounds great. But, you know, what about the fact that I have a hole in my, my roof? What are you going to do about that? Um, so that is a huge part of the debate is how can you move quickly with everyone <laughs> at the same time? You know, the like you move faster alone, you move further together. Well, we need to do both. So that's part of it. But then when you get actually like how that shows itself on the ground, you see this both on the transportation side and the building side, there's a debate on, um, not really a debate, but I think there's a, been a, a racialization of certain technologies or approaches. And it's not everywhere, right? Like what I'm seeing in Philadelphia is not necessarily what I, I see in New York, but I think an example that's really hot right now in Philadelphia is bike lanes. Here's a great example. 
why does more bike lanes on a street, even if the intended purpose is actually to make the street safer and slower so people could cross it and reduce the amount of injuries. And most of those injuries are happening to people of color who live nearby. But if you add bike lanes to narrow the street, well, all of a sudden, there's going to be distrust in that in that policy. Um, so I'm, I'm completely generalizing, but this was a real life example on Washington Avenue here, where there was like two years of, of community outreach and processes and stakeholder engagement that came up with these different scenarios for a road. And at the end of the day, the one that seemed to optimize the outcomes for the most folks, it had more bike lanes and right away uh, there, was, there, was, there was pushback and it was thrown out. The actual like outcomes were not uh, given equal weight because the idea of bike lanes themselves have become loaded. And we see that on the building side with um, heat pumps and the use of fossil fuels. Even it, it's no longer, it's not necessarily always about the outcome, it's about who's it for. And even when there's good intentions um, because of the amount of, of distrust, um, there's this there's uh, an assumption that what you're trying to do is the same old same old and it's not going to be good good for me so those are some of the debates and i think they all honestly get back to that how at the beginning i have to believe that if engagement was done correctly with the right people at the table and the right communications that it would take out some of those um you know lack of, of trust but um but I don't, I, it doesn't always seem to work so far. <laughs> Daniel? Great, thanks, Ariella. And just to you know, sort of jump off of where you're coming from as well, there are some really just specific examples in Rockaway about how the people who live there have been left out of the conversation. So I think, I, well, I wanna start off with one of the, the biggest sort of um, one of the biggest policy changes that is is always happening in Rockaway and that is a big sort of just thing that people will focus on is the flood maps because the flood maps give a very sober outlook about Rockaway's future not just 50 years and 100 years down the line but 20 to 30 years down the line from now and I see when people from outside of Rockaway come here to do work, to do studies, to, to create projects that it says, well, let's look at the flood maps first. And they ask us, what do people in Rockaway think about the flood maps? We try our best to educate people about these flood maps, but they're put out with, with no concern for what the lines are actually crossing they're crossing people's homes that they've lived in for 40 to 50 years. And when, this, when organizations like FEMA put out these flood maps, they don't work with people to explain them. They just throw them out to people and expect people to understand them and what they mean and what that's gonna mean down the line for people. But if a person isn't looking at maps as part of their daily job and interest every day, those maps are really hard to understand. And so that educational engagement component is lost and then people do not care. And that's where distrust comes from. Another example is a few years ago, the Department of Environmental Protection held a community engagement meeting at one of the local, uh, one of the local school campuses in Rockaway. They scheduled it for 4.30 PM on a Wednesday. Most of the people who work in Far Rockaway are working outside the peninsula because there are not many jobs here. So they're taking the subway over an hour and a half into Manhattan and Brooklyn. If they're getting out of work at five o'clock, they're never gonna make it to the 4.30 to six o'clock meeting that was scheduled about a pipeline off the coast less than three miles from their home to have their voices heard. And that just breeds more distrust in this community. Another very current example, the Arvern East development. Community members who came to RISE's community visioning in Edgemere process these last six months have continually asked RISE, when are we gonna be able to have our voices heard about what's happening in Arvern East? We have a lot of concern as homeowners, as NYCHA residents, and as climate activists ourselves. 
I'm not the main project manager for Auburn East, but my coworker who is, every meeting she goes to with the developments and the governmental agencies involved with Auburn East, she says, when is the community engagement process happening? And they say, we'll let you know next time. We'll let you know next time. Well, these people need to have their voices heard and learn about what you want to do in their community. And without that, no real change is going to happen. The distrust is gonna stay. And these issues of climate change and resiliency are not really gonna be, are not going to matter to the people who live there because they didn't have a chance to, to speak about it and give their thoughts and tell people about their daily existence and the, 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 the experiences they have every day just leaving their homes. So, it's really weird to see that that disconnect, which has been talked about for so long, and to work with a lot of agencies who don't want to make headway on that front, when that is a really big core piece of, of all of this work. For RISE, one of our main goals during all of our projects is just to give people the tools to advocate for themselves. So community visioning in Edgemere you know, the main goal was let's figure out how we want to design these spaces with temporary structures so that they can still help us during flood events, whether that be a storm or everyday flooding. But the other main priority of our work within these three forums was just to help people see how they can push to have their voices heard, their ideas, their wants, their needs, how they can stay involved in the process while dealing with an organization like the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development in New York City. Let's talk about where you can find funding for specific ideas. Let's talk about what sort of groups you can go to to learn more. Let's talk about how to get your thoughts down on paper in the best way possible that government agencies are gonna be able to respond to you. Let's make sure that as the community land trust is coming to fruition, that it's not given to someone who doesn't know or understand Rockaway, but that it's from someone within the community because there's been two to three groups that have submitted applications to be the nonprofit that's gonna manage that community land trust. Our goal is always to make sure that people can advocate for themselves and their communities, maybe even more so sometimes than the specific plans and ideas we're coming up with. Because as long as people feel like they can be engaged, then they're more likely to be. There's lots of jargon that's thrown around and people get scared and worried that they're not gonna understand it or that people aren't gonna take them seriously. So we wanna make sure that they know that they will be taken seriously because we're helping to cure them up. So that's one way that RISE is trying to tackle this sort of policy disconnect between the people making the plans and the people being affected by the plans. Great, thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> and I have one last question here. Um, and you know, this conversation so far has been really interesting. I, I, th I think of some of the themes that are emerging from the conversation here um, in terms of um, exclusion um, of, of certain communities from the policy debates. Um, in, in the case of uh, Victoria, I, I think of the context of this colonial uh, relationship between the U.S. and Hawaii and, the, and some of the Pacific Islands you uh, work in um, and the kind of uh, lasting effect of that uh, relationship um, present in the interaction between um, Hawaii and institutions like FEMA um, and HUD um, that provide resources um, for responding to the effects of climate change. Um, not, not too differently, actually. Uh, I, I think of uh, the work of, of Daniel and uh, the Rockaways and communities like Edgemere that are still dealing with the legacies of racial segregation in the, in the United States, of racial exclusion, which has a lot of parallels um, with these sort of uh, colonial processes of exclusion and oppression. There's a lot of similarities there um, and, um, it, it's interesting that we, we are still dealing with those um, problems and now very much within the context of, of climate change and responding to the climate crisis. Um, the, the other thing that stands out to me is uh, the comments made by Ariella 
about how we define the, the crisis itself, right? Um, we, we, can, we can continue to think of it as this um, physical and natural phenomenon that's um, an external force acting on our communities. Um, and therefore the response has to be more investment in infrastructure or some sort of technological fix. Uh, but as what Ariel is pointing to is that in fact, some of the main drivers of risk in these communities are things like low quality housing, are things like um, uh, lack of access to transportation, basic planning problems um, that we've been dealing with for a long time. These are the main drivers of risk in these communities. Um, and so it really does force us to rethink how we design or, or uh, put together um, policies and planning strategies to address the climate crisis. So with, within that context, I wanna pose this last question to, to the panelists. Um, looking forward, um, how, how would you define climate justice? What, is, what does climate justice look like in this context? And, and for this, I'll, I'll open it to the panel. Uh, whoever wants to take the first stab at, at this question, please, please feel free to do so. I think someone else should go first this time. <laughs> okay. Sure, I can, I can jump in. Uh, I'll keep it uh, brief and short. For me, climate justice is having the most open and sincere conversation you can between policymakers and the communities that are being affected by those policies. If you can be open and honest with people about what the data means, about what you're trying to get done, and really give them the chance just to talk. That's all people want to do is have is, is talk and have their voices heard. You know, when we came back for our first in-person meeting, you could hear the decibel levels rise when we did an icebreaker activity just because people were so excited to talk to each other and see each other again. And afterwards, people don't even sometimes talk about the specific activities that we did. They just said, thank you for bringing us here and letting us speak to each other. So if you can open up that conversation and have it be more intimate and human and personal, I think that that's going to remedy a lot of the issues our um, communities of color, especially, have faced for so long. Thank you, Daniel. On one hand, I don't think I should ever be defining environmental justice for any community. I think even defining what justice looks like and what it is is something that is place specific um, and should be defined. So I don't mean to um to to elude the question there are a few key principles you know you see it when you see the the climate marches that sign that says systems change not climate change i mean that's a big part of it it's there's a lot of underlying systems that that need to be completely rethought for us to actually be able to address the climate crisis and the other big theme is the theme of power and it's seeding power it's ceding power to folks we've made powerless for the last you know, few centuries, um, if not longer, if you, you look outside the, the United States. And that's really hard shift to make in the way our institutions work and the way decisions are uh, work, but it's, it's part of that systems change. Thank you, Ariella. Um, yeah, I like Daniel and Ariella's um, definitions and comments a lot. Um, and I guess I agree that, uh, that I guess climate justice is linked to recognizing the different factors that have caused different communities to um, experience climate impacts unequally. Um, so whether that's you know, historical inequities, colonial inequities, um, nuclear histories in our region, for example, um, and then how to center and empower the voices that have not been heard um, and give them the resources that they um, need to be in the conversation and respond to um, climate impacts, whether those are financial resources, human resources, educational resources, cultural resources, um, figuring out with the community what is needed. Great, thank you, Victoria. And with that, um, we have uh, a few minutes left here um, to turn it over to the audience. Um, want to give the audience an opportunity to, to pose some questions to the panelists. Uh, 
Yeah, um, thank you all for your insightful comments. Um, I can read out the questions uh, that are in the chat. And um, meanwhile, I just want to uh, remind the audience that on Zoom, you can also use the raise your hand feature and uh, you know I can call on you to unmute and you can ask your question directly. Uh, but meanwhile, I'll, I'll read out the questions in the chat. So I think we can start with uh, Johanna's question. Um, so she writes, uh, Ariela, you mentioned two years of engagement for the bike lanes that were ultimately not successful in delivering bike lanes. Is the takeaway that engagement wasn't, the, wasn't with the right people or the engagement format wasn't right? Or maybe engagement could have taken a step back and listened first before assuming bike lanes were the solutions. What could have been done differently? Uh, thanks. I, I answered in the chat, but I'll discuss it again here and then apologies that I need to go pick up my son. Um, you know, at the time of this design project, COVID happened and the consulting firm that was leading this had to shift their outreach tactics to ones that were more virtual. That said, they really were looking to create an inclusive process with different ways of communicating. So if you couldn't make it on the internet for a virtual meeting, they, they did look to other things. And actually many were looking at it as a model of civic engagement in this era. Like, wow, look, look at that pivot. What can we learn from it? Which is why a lot of folks were shocked when in the end it, it all fell apart. But if you really peel back the onion, it was never about, the thing was never about bike lanes and who wants bike lanes and who, who doesn't. Um, this was, it's a really unsafe street, Washington Avenue. It's this major corridor that cuts all across the city. Um, and this was all about, about safety, but some community leaders who represent uh, marginalized communities who are often left out of discussion and therefore are bringing a lot of past harms and grievances with them. There wasn't that extra level of, of outreach and, and, and bringing folks in and doing the political work that have to, you know, not just the engagement work, but that extra political work, like take the time to bring these folks in more um, have special meetings, get you know city council aligned, get everyone aligned. I think that would have made a process, and that's hard to do. You know, one thing that philanthropy doesn't fund, and city government doesn't fund, and other we don't fund enough of the space to have those conversations. It takes a lot of resources and a lot of time and a lot of people to be able to engage appropriately. And it's usually the least funded things. It's easier to fund you know, um, a, a piece of something than it is to actually fund a person whose job it is to be a connector and do that extra bit of, of, of outreach. And again, apologies that I have to, to leave, but I'll follow up with Hugo to hear all of the, the great comments that I'm sure you all have. Thank you, Ariella. Thank you. Um, Hugo, would you like to add anything to that or uh, should I go on to the next question? Um, I, I think we should go on. I want to give others an opportunity to join the conversation. I think I'll go to the next question, which is actually my question. Um, so um, I guess I, I um, sort of framed this question for Daniel, but uh, Victoria, I think you too might uh, be able to shed some light on this. Uh, but this is basically related to uh, Daniel's, uh, you know, discussion about the, the illegibility of uh, FEMA maps to communities and the need for like further community engagement. So I was wondering, um, I, I'm not familiar with the US context, but I was wondering about the processes that go into the production of these maps. Is there um, a mismatch between the way risk is defined by institutions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the way communities identify risk, um, you know, and the timeline that um, sort of institutional uh, definitions uh, hold versus uh, community definitions. Um, so if you could just comment on that. Sure thing, yeah. So I can't speak too much about the, the physical production and, and what goes into making that too much on that side specifically. 
But I do think there is somewhat of a mismatch between how it's defined by the two different groups. You know, we talked about how there, there's these projections years down the line, not so far, 20, 30 years, but still years down the line, whereas people are dealing with daily problems and experiences that aren't being addressed every day, just as they're trying to get to work or to school or et cetera. So, you know, always referring to the maps, even though everyone in the community knows about the risks and understands that 20, 30 years down the line, you know, we're going to be having a completely different kind of conversation to just say, well, this is what we're worried about and not what's happening today is really hard for people to hear because it just compounds that distrust and the neglect that they felt for so long. And, and again, a lot of these maps, uh, the organizations that are putting them out are not really just, you know, having a workshop where they can explain to people exactly what they mean, talk about where the data came from it and what this means in terms of, of flood insurance, you know, people just see the number, the, the prices for their flood insurance going up and are wondering like, hey, why wasn't I told about this? Like, why is my bill so much more? And then, you know, the worry is, is my only option 20 to 30 years down the line to move? But when you tell people you've got to pack up your whole life and move, it's like, wow, like we were moved. My family was moved here 40, 50 years ago against their will. We've been trying to live here, trying to get resources. And now you're saying we have to pack up and move again. Like there's no empathetic conversation that's happening there. It's just sort of like the data says this, so do this. And, and people don't get a chance to just say like, well, this is how I feel about that. And is there something else that can be done? Like maybe if you hear from us, you we have ideas ourselves, listen to these. And also if, if we talk to each other, maybe there's something else that we're not thinking of that can happen. Um, so I just think these maps that are thrown at people it is really hard for people to grasp and understand when there's so much more room for an intimate, empathetic conversation that's not yet happening. I'll add um, a little bit to that and um, more on the on the data side. So again, I don't know exactly how um, the maps are always produced with the, the flood maps by FEMA, but I know that um, it's always a um, contentious conversation and the maps are not forward looking in terms of projected climate impacts and sea level rise impacts. They're based on historical data and historical flood maps, which are already, um, you know, in many cases outdated. So I, I think there's actually, um, I think that FEMA did an experimental uh, sea level rise projection map for um, areas impacted by Hurricane Sandy after the event, um, but those are experimental. And um, although they exist, they're not um, incorporated into um, flood map, you know, pricing and insurance risk and things like that. They're really for just, you know, people's own use. So I think there is a mismatch, um, you know, both between the risk, ways risk is defined by institutions versus communities and the way it's defined um, between um, the institutions that have financial stakes in those maps like flood insurance or insurance overall reinsurance and um, and the institutions that are making those maps um, and what they're able to put in them. And then again, there's another conversation um, about um, the use of uh, different kinds of social vulnerability indices. So there's, um, um, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on this at all, but I know there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of debate over the appropriateness of different kinds of social vulnerability layers and how they're overlaid on different communities um, and uh, used in terms of determining risk. Thank you, Let me say um, I think it's always interesting to sort of gain a, you know, bottom uh, up and top down perspective at the same time about how these uh, systems sort of interact on the ground. Um, Lincoln's question. Um, so, the question to the panelists, um, how do you fa facilitate discussion on the trade-offs of mitigation versus adapt adaptation investments with stakeholders, um, the short-term rewards versus thinking long-term? Um, and then he says, thanks for the great uh, tacit knowledge, uh, knowledge examples of engagement for climate justice.
yeah, I guess Victoria, if you would like to start on that, if, if I'm not putting you on the spot. Uh, yeah, Lincoln, you can see we're, we're not jumping in because, of course, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> How do you facilitate that discussion? I mean, I think a lot of what Daniel was saying earlier um, kind of addresses it, you know, that true empathetic engagement, sustained engagement, finding resources to, I, I guess, um, Ariella was was mentioning it, mentioning it to, you know, what is a way to really fund sustained interaction with stakeholders and work with them, um, you know, so that they they are part of the conversation and are making decisions in terms of mitigation and adaptation investments. Um, and I think, you know, besides the fact that that's not easily funded in a lot of cases, it's also extremely difficult to do, you know, it, it's not um, it's not an easy job. You know, there, there are people in some, like in Honolulu, um, we have people at the, the City Office of Climate Change Resiliency and Sustainability um, that were funded through the 100 Resilient Cities Initiative to, you know, with a, with a very um, explicit process, go out and engage with different stakeholders, different communities. I think they engaged with over, you know, 6,000 people on the island and um, all of these different communities really bringing a lot of these questions of, you know, shorter versus longer term thinking into a series of 42 adaptation and mitigation and resiliency actions that were then folded into um, a climate resiliency plan for the island. Um, and that's one example of, you know, a very well funded and well thought out way of um, of getting buy-in, but um, I definitely would open it up to Daniel um, for, for more comments as well. Yeah, thanks, Victoria. As we all saw, I was trying to like gather my thoughts there because it's it's so hard to really fully answer that question. And, you know, I think part of it is I don't fully know, but I do know from our experience that the the grassroots part of it needs to be maintained, you know? we were doing our best for our last visioning project just to go door to door, hand out flyers, talk to people. Um, because, you know, the, a lot of people in Edgemere and Rockaway and Auburn just don't even get the opportunity to, to do meetings like this. So just letting them know that is happening and that we'd love to hear from them no matter what their contribution might be is important. And then, you know, on the other side of it, trying to engage with the city and, and private development firms. It, it's, it's really hard because as Victoria mentioned, sometimes that, that funding isn't there for them to always send someone and have someone be the face of, of what is going on. So we're trying our best just to be the, the sort of middle person that can sort of, you know, bring the discussion and questionings that are happening over here with the community through and over to the other side as best as possible. Um, because if, if there can't be that direct link right now, at least there can be some sort of link where, where we're working as a, a community organization that's based there and has been there for so long to help guide the conversation back and forth. Um, so I think, yeah, again, you, you just do your best. Um, as Ariella was saying before, it's just really hard. Um, so you work with what you got and you try to bring as many people to the table as you can, as much as possible to have as frank and open a discussion as you can. And I think that that's right now where, where I fall on the spectrum of, of, of trying to uh, you know, facilitate those discussions of, of trade-offs versus adaptation and short-term versus long-term. Um, and we have to see how those conversations continue to develop and how that can change our thinking moving forward. Um, are there any more questions? I think we are almost out of time, but if somebody has one question, we could kind of squeeze it in. Uh, if that's all, uh, please. Yeah, that's true. If Victoria, you want to speak a little more to that, uh, please feel free to. I think it's, uh, yeah, just my comment that, um, you know, it, it's, we're talking again and again about being inclusive and getting the right people at the table, but 
we are all so overtapped, you know, <laughs> everyone from academia to organizations, to communities, to parents, to public health, like everybody is dealing with so many balls in the air that asking them to come to another meeting or make time to engage on a new problem that they hadn't thought about before is a lot to ask. So, you know, being conscious of, of people's times and overtapping stakeholders who um, have so many things on their plate, I think is, is something that we're all conscious of and need to be conscious of. Yeah, 100% Victoria. And I'll say um, all this COVID and virtual things has been helpful a little bit because sometimes people can't make it physically to a building. So at least if they have the virtual option, they can sit in, type in the chat if they don't wanna speak out loud. That's some way to help people get more involved. And just as another example, like we had a core group of organizational leaders that we engaged with for our last visioning process. And they said, we originally had it scheduled for Saturday afternoon, the meetings, and they were like, no, 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 move it to 10 a.m., get people before they go out and do their shopping and chores for the day, because they're much more likely to come earlier than later. And we're like, okay, we're gonna move it earlier. You have the knowledge about that, um, so we're gonna make it happen for you. So remember, just adapt to what the feedback that you're getting. Yeah, it was interesting when we, we started having our climate commission meetings virtually during the pandemic, and if you've, I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room has been to local or city government meetings before. And there's, you know, a recurring cast of characters that you see pretty regularly. And suddenly we were, you know, the Zoom squares were all these people and voices that we hadn't seen before. Um, so in that, you know, in, in that case, I, I definitely saw the conversation space opening up um, from the commission's perspective, but at the same time, um, there are some, some groups that we still haven't been able to get in contact with and we need to do direct outreach and go out there. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's very insightful. Um, and I also wonder whether people see uh, the COVID crisis as a sort of continuation of uh, you know, the climate problem and how these things are sort of intertwined also at some level. Um, yeah, but I think we are almost out of time. So, um, you know, if you have any uh, closing remarks. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, well, we're, we're at time here. And so uh, I just wanted to thank, <clears throat> first of all, I wanted to thank um, the panelists for joining us today for making the time. On that note, recognizing how busy everyone is and how you're pulled in all these different directions. We very much appreciate your time and uh, your presence with us here today to have this really important conversation. Um, this is, as, as uh, was explained earlier, part of a series of talks um, where we're really trying to kind of engage um, the discussion around the climate crisis from different angles. Um, and this one being a really important one, sort of trying to center uh, some of the communities um, that are often overlooked um, in this discussion. And so thank you so much, Victoria. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, we look forward to staying in touch and learning more about your work as it develops. Um, and then last, uh, I wanna say thank you uh, to the organizers of the event, to Ranjani, Carolyn, and Elena, um, our incredible doctoral students at GSAP um, who are organizing uh, this series of events. Um, this is another great one, and uh, I look forward to the next one. Thank you all for having me, and um, see you next time. Thanks so much, Hugo. And uh, yeah, thank you to the panelists uh, on the behalf of GSAP and Urban Planning Program in particular. Uh, we really appreciate you taking out the time to come and uh, speak with us. Um, and to everyone else, make sure uh, to join us next week. Uh, sorry, next week is the spring break, but after the spring break um, for our next lip talk by uh, Dr. Ines Sanchez de Madriaga, uh, whose talk will be on gender and planning from research to implementation. Um, thank you, everyone. <laughs>